Hi, everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Chats with Shauna episode. This is an episode type where you'll hear a free-flowing conversation with myself about life in the States. This is casual, so you'll hear pausing and thinking. You'll hear natural transitions from one idea to the next. And that's all in hopes that, if you can't already, you'll someday be able to do this also in English. I hope you enjoy this topic. Today, we'll be discussing five surprising things about Los Angeles. If you've been following this podcast, you might know that in episode 113, I spoke about our big move from a small town in Northern California, aka NorCal, to a metropolis, to Los Angeles, which is located in Southern California, also known as SoCal. Back in that episode, I explained my concerns about moving here which were pretty much founded on previous experiences in the city, some stereotypes and impressions made from films and movies. The most notable concerns had to do with the cost of living, traffic, the fact you need a car, and what goes along with this, of course, pollution. I also mentioned the valley, which is the San Fernando Valley right outside of downtown LA, which was once famous for its valley girls. Oh my God, like the valley girls are like so like interesting. (laughs) I'm kidding. The valley is an area where in the past there were a group of women, girls, the valley girls, that spoke in that fashion. They spoke in a ditzy way. Ditzy means dumb or not intelligent. And of course, people still talk like that nowadays. You'll see it on social media. But I don't think it's confined to a specific geographic region. I have to say, even myself, I catch myself sometimes overusing the word like. And I'm conscious of it. I try and pause and speak more slowly. It happens when I'm excited about something or when I'm talking to old friends from high school and like emerges like confetti. It's a filler that is not very pretty in my opinion. If you can avoid using like as a filler in English, just do it. Just avoid it. Uh, Let's get into the five surprising things. First off, I'd like to say LA is growing on us. Since we moved here, we haven't been bored once, I don't think. During the week, Lucas has singers and songwriters here. We eat meals together. Sometimes, if we're lucky, some of the people visiting will perform for us, which is quite fun. On the weekends, we spend most of the days out exploring. Sunday is always fun day. Sunday fun day. woo! And it's just a good time. It's been about five months now, and I'm convinced that every neighborhood here has at least one cool area to walk and enjoy. The cool thing that I didn't know, which is bringing me to point number one, is that if you get sick of the hustle, the hustle, the movement from one place to the next, like taking your car to work and back from work, you can get out. You can go to the mountains and the beaches, and that's point one. Nobody talks about LA's nature, but it's here. So I went to the dentist the other day, and the dental hygienist was chatting away with me about differences he's noticed between Northern and Southern California. Now, these are the sorts of conversations I wish I had recorded for you guys, but it's sort of awkward mid sentence to say, you know, hey, can I record this? This is interesting for my podcast. Um, So, I'll just have to recap for you. He said, oh, 
you're from Northern California? You must miss the beautiful nature there. People here go to Runyon Canyon Park to go hiking, but they're secretly out there only to see celebrities. Now, imagine me. I'm laying down on the dentist chair going, wait, what? Why is that? Are there celebrities out there? He goes, oh, yeah. That's where all of the famous people go hiking on weekends. And I'm sitting there going, hmm, interesting. What was the name of that again? Runyon Canyon? How do you spell Runyon? Anyway, I don't really care about seeing celebrities, but it's kind of fun, I guess, to know where the action is happening. For those of you who do care, Runyon is spelled R-U-N-Y-O-N, and that's Runyon Canyon Park, if you want to be creepy and celebrity stalk. But anyway, we did end up talking about the difference between nature up north and down south. Up north, there are many mountains covered in pine trees. There are plenty of hiking trails. There are quite a few lakes to visit. But I was pleasantly surprised to learn about how many hiking trails there are near LA. And what's awesome is that they have stunning views of both the valley, the ocean. So if you ever feel suffocated by people and cars, you can step away a very short distance from here and get a breath of fresh air. The freshest air might be at the beaches and there are like a million beaches here. I'm exaggerating, of course, but you could spend the summer hopping from one to the next. As a kid growing up in Northern California, my family often took trips down south. Actually, it's what many families do. The typical trip involves going to Disneyland, Universal Studios, and Hollywood. And somewhere in the midst of all that, uh, most families hit up a number of beaches. To hit up means to visit or call someone. For example, if I say I'm going to hit up the beach later, it means I'm going to visit the beach later. If I say I'll hit you up or hit you up, it means I'll call you. You can decipher the meaning of hit up based on context. Uh, back to the point, when my family was in SoCal, as a kid, they would hit up a bunch of beaches. We would visit them. And they have a certain vibe. Most SoCal beaches are well taken care of. They're long, sandy, and clean. Some have palm trees. Others have rocky cliffs. Beaches in popular areas usually have restaurants, candy shops, and stores. If not lining the beach, then walking distance from the water. My really good friend, my best friend from Germany, is actually visiting me at the moment. And I remembered while thinking about this podcast episode that she used to have a stereotype of California beaches when she first came here as an exchange student back when we were 16. On a California beach, you'll find people rollerblading down the sidewalk or on the boardwalk, wearing a bikini and short shorts and backwards baseball caps. That was her image of a California beach, which I find kind of funny um, because it's also true. There are some beaches where you'll see that stereotype image. I'm not sure if you guys have that stereotype as well. But you can see the, um, the rollerbladers and the, the skateboarders and stuff down by the water in Santa Monica and in Venice Beach, also in Pacific Beach in San Diego. But once again, these are just a few of many, many beaches. There's so much nature near L.A. OK, number two, it's about superficiality. Okay, people care about how things look, but does that make them superficial? It's a question. Think about it. So there is a stereotype of L.A. being that it's superficial. Now, I don't particularly enjoy talking about stereotypes like these ones because, to be honest, they're sort of massive generalizations. But I tried to see if I could find some truth behind the stereotype. What do appearances mean to people in L.A.? Now, I have caught Lucas multiple times doing a 180 turn to check out not women, but cars. 
Now, where we live in Canoga Park, it's just 20 minutes away from Malibu, very close to Calabasas, the home area of many rich and famous people. In both places, you'll see Ferraris, Rolls Royces, McLarens, Bentleys, Maseratis, Lamborghinis, you know, all of those words <laughs> flying around you down Highway 1, right next to the ocean. Uh, if you were to ask me which do you prefer between a Lamborghini and a Ferrari, I'd probably say a potato patata, meaning, I don't know, whatever, they're the same to me, it makes no difference, potato patata. Uh, Lucas would think that's a ridiculous comment, but the point is people do care about cars. There are a lot of people that do. Uh, it's not something that you would see up in Northern California in a small town, of course. In Malibu, also, there are mansions that sit along the hill with ocean views. If you've ever watched the show on Netflix called Selling Sunset, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. People have huge lots with extravagant facades. So the front of their houses are just, you know, they have a lot of, um, what do they call it? Curb appeal. Curb appeal is what they call it. Um, so it looks good from the street. And many of them cost between 50 and $100 million. I can't even process that. Yesterday, I was driving uh, with my friend from Germany up Highway 1, and we were commenting on all of the crazy houses. Some are so architecturally unique, you can't help but stare, which is not so safe while driving. But yeah, we live in a very normal neighborhood. But even so, everybody has a gardener and perfect lawns and perfect fruit trees and perfect plants. Nothing looks bad. Everybody takes care of their lawns. I feel like if you're the person that just lets your grass die and has dirt out front, I don't know. It's just not the same as it was in Northern California where I lived previously. Now let's talk about the people, the appearance. So according to Statista, there are more plastic surgeons in the U.S. than anywhere else in the world. Over 7,000 plastic surgeons. Beverly Hills, which is a really wealthy neighborhood here, has over 70 plastic surgeons in six square miles. Now, Lucas, my husband, being from Brazil, the second most popular country for plastic surgery, commented on how it feels like more people here get dramatic cosmetic work done than in Brazil. As in, it's not subtle. It's very obvious. I mean, if someone gets a lip job, then they get really big lips. Or if someone gets a boob job, really big boobs. Um, I can agree with that. Some people do go overboard on Botox. They might get too many facelifts or visit plastic surgeons that don't do a great job. Most definitely, I've seen more here than in New York or San Francisco. But of course, this is not everyone. Uh, actually, none of my friends have had work done. But it is interesting. It's visible. Another thing dealing with personal appearance. So a nail salon for me is a place of ultimate relaxation. The massage chair with the quiet music in the background. And then the feeling of getting my feet scrubbed so that they look nice and shiny. Since I met Lucas, I've been trying to get him to go with me to a nail salon just once. And every time I ask him, the look on his face is like, uh, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, even though he doesn't outright say it, I think he views a nail salon as a place for women or an activity for women. Uh, and while in most places, yeah, salons are packed with women, in Los Angeles, there are so many men at the nail salon, um, all ages, all types. And that was really surprising for me. It's cool. I think men should be able to get their themselves pampered too. So I hope Lucas will be convinced at some point. Back to the original question, what makes someone superficial? If someone cares about the car they drive, how their house looks, how they look, does that make them superficial? Or is superficiality just in behavior? If someone acts a certain way to your face, and then talks behind your back. Because if I think about it, I really think it's more about behavior. 
Um, this is just my personal opinion. I have not met a mean person here, and it doesn't feel like it's inauthentic. People just seem very friendly and authentically friendly. So yes, I would like to knock that stereotype. What's your opinion on this topic? Number three, oh my gosh, there's so much money. <laughs> um, so there was a TV show growing up that I used to watch with my parents called The Beverly Hillbillies which is, of course, a play on Beverly Hills, the neighborhood I was just speaking about that's very wealthy, uh, that has just simply a lot of money. That show was filmed in Beverly Hills, and the house that was on the show sold in 2017 for $150 million. I thought it was the most expensive house ever sold in the United States, but it turns out that the most expensive house in the U.S. is in Bel Air. Another neighborhood in LA, which is worth $295 million. Can you process that? You might remember Bel Air from The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. What's kind of fun about LA is that because of all of the film studios, there are so many famous people who live here. There's actually a tour that you can take where you can go to movie stars' homes. It's a sort of goofy pink and black van. You can take a look at the houses, take some pictures. There aren't any gates or large fences in Beverly Hills, so you can just walk on by and see the stunning architecture and landscaping. My family actually really enjoys walking around Beverly Hills because it's just peaceful and green. And last time we were there, we stopped at Lucille Ball's house. Lucas was driving. At one point, he's like, who is Lucille Ball? I realized then that I need to do an episode on classic shows you should know. Lucille Ball is the main character of I Love Lucy, one of the most popular shows on television during the 1950s. Lucy is an icon and an incredibly notable actress in American television history. Housing is expensive. Food here is expensive. You guys, I went to the Pacific Palisades the other day and saw avocados for $5 each, and a box of strawberries for $20. A small container of strawberries. In my head, all I could think of was, how could strawberries be so expensive? Like, did the person who picked them put magic fairy glitter on them that can make you fly? Is the berry company donating three-fourths of the profits to charity? I don't think even if I made a million dollars a day, I could justify buying $20 strawberries. That's just me though. I have spent $8 on a latte, $6 on a scoop of ice cream. It hurts. Products sometimes just feel overpriced. I'm just thankful that places do exist where you can find affordable things, like my favorite grocery store, Trader Joe's. Let's move on to point number four. We ended up finding a nice house to rent in the valley in an area called Canoga Park, which is where Meghan Markle grew up. Meghan Markle is, I believe, the only American in the British royal family. She's the Duchess of Sussex. It was a bit of a challenge to find a house on one weekend. That was our goal, but we did it. It has a studio for Lucas to bring guests over to work on songs. And in general, we're just happy with its location. There's one thing, though, that we're not too happy about, and it's number four on our list, crickets. Do you know what a cricket is? Jiminy Cricket, perhaps, from Pinocchio? Crickets are in the same family as a grasshopper. That's the animal that makes a very pleasant chirping sound at nighttime. When you're camping and looking at the stars, it's calming. When that sound is inside of your home, it's disturbing. House crickets, I've learned, are a thing of the San Fernando Valley. During wintertime mostly, they come through the drain or tiny cracks in the walls of your house or in your apartment. Looking for food and water or maybe warmth, possibly a combo of the three. Anyway, they appear at night. And they just kind of hang out and hop around. Now, the first day we moved in, 
uh, we decided to get Panda Express for dinner, which is sort of like a fast food Chinese restaurant. And we had a picnic on our kitchen floor because we had sold our dining table beforehand. And yeah, why not? Have a picnic. If you don't know by now, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, both girls, and they eat like cavemen. So after dinner, uh, after eating all this rice and veggies and meat, it was scattered everywhere. And let's just say I managed to clean up most of it, but the floor was not immaculate. There were little pieces of rice here and there. But that night, in the middle of the night, when I decided to get up to grab a glass of water, I saw a family of crickets congregated in the middle of our kitchen floor. I'm talking about like 15 crickets. It freaked me out so badly. I'm not going to lie. When I freak out, I tend to research too. And online, the first thing that popped up was a number of pest control ads for the valley. I'd never heard of house crickets before. I'd heard of termite infested houses where you need to call an exterminator to come and fumigate the place. I'd heard of problems with mice. People, you know, set up traps and catch mice and get rid of them. I don't know. In fact, I even used to live in an old building in Paris for a summer. And there was a family of mice that would scurry across the kitchen when you walked in. Some people got used to them. Others didn't. The point is, I had never heard of house crickets. It's wild. It's a thing here. My landlord has instructed me to just pick them up and carry them outside. So, interesting. (laughs) Number five, the service industry is on crack. To be on crack means to be wild or crazy. The first day I moved to LA, my neighbor's car was parked in front of her house and some guy pulled up to clean it. He started pulling out vacuums, hoses, the whole setup, the whole shebang. I was confused. In my small city where we moved from, you go to the car wash when your car gets dirty. Or you go in front of your house in your driveway, you get rags, sponges, soap, and a garden hose, and you do it on your own. In this area of LA, yeah, of course, they have car washes, but it's so easy to hire someone to come to you to wash your car. In fact, you can hire anyone pretty much at any point in the day to do anything for you. Now, I'm not living under a rock. I lived in New York City for two years, and my friend would call a delivery person whenever she ran out of eggs or toilet paper, whatever. The person would run to the store for her, pick it up, bring it to the doorstep, and then she would just tip them. That was pretty much it. But it's not something that I've ever done. It's not really my jam. I enjoy going to the store, looking at products, putting them in the shopping cart, checking out. But the thing is here, it's so easy to fall into the trap of easy service. Just a few weeks ago, Lucas decided he needed to build a sound booth for a singer that was going to arrive in 12 hours. And at a moment's notice, on the spur of the moment, we were able to use an app to have someone go pick out curtains for us, supplies, and drinks, and food for dinner. It was so simple, and that's why I call it a trap. All you have to do is tip them. Now, I'll post the link to have a personal shopper like this in the episode notes, but I'm warning you, if you can fall into these traps, don't click on that link, all right? Anyway, it felt really bougie. Bougie is actually a great word to know. It's short for bourgeois. Um, Actually, it's sort of different, bougie. (laughs) Um, Bourgeois is a French word that we use in English to refer to uh, the middle or upper middle class. Bougie is when someone or something tries to be a higher class or classier than one is. For example, someone who wears a knockoff Louis Vuitton bag and fake Jimmy Choo shoes to appear wealthy would be bougie. I also mentioned knockoff. So a knockoff Louis Vuitton bag would be a bag not produced by Louis Vuitton, 
It's produced by some other company, some maybe a factory that printed the same design of Louis Vuitton on it, but it's not actually the real thing. So we would call that a knockoff. Anyway, what was I talking about? Um, so we are speaking about the ease of shopping. So in episode number two, we talked about Amazon Go stores and their cashierless checkout. You just get food and leave the store. So there's an Amazon Fresh store around the corner from me with all of the same technology I described in episode number two. They have smart carts, smart shelves that tell you how much products are rated on Amazon. Alexa is everywhere throughout the store. So I can say, Alexa, where's the milk? And she's like, it's on aisle eight. There's fresh food. So if I want sushi, Chinese food, Mexican, fresh bread, there are Amazon cards in the front of the store. You can return your Amazon packages there. It's all there. It's too easy. But I'm curious to know, how do you feel about all this stuff? Is it cool? Would you get a personal shopper? Would you shop at Amazon Fresh? In any case, that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed the five things I found surprising about LA. Number one, again, was the nature. It's so much closer to nature than I expected. Number two, I spoke about superficiality. I really don't think people are superficial, but then again, it all depends on your definition of what superficial is. What do you guys think? Oh my gosh, there's so much money. That's number three. Number four were crickets. Crickets are all over the valley. What in the world? And number five, the service industry. Yeah, so hope you guys come to visit LA. Summer here is a lot of fun. I'm already so excited to throw on a tank top every day, a pair of shorts, a pair of flip flops. It gets hot here. If you do come here, be sure to check out the touristy stuff. I know that Santa Monica Pier is super popular, uh, but it's worth visiting. You know, there's the Ferris wheel. You can go on rides right over the Pacific Ocean. You also can't miss Venice Beach to see the skateboarding. You can join a drum circle. You can grab a bite to eat with a nice ocean view. The sun shines strong, so you'll need to apply lots of sunblock or sunscreen. Both words work. And yeah, come get a suntan. Come visit. Hope you're having a nice day. And until next time, bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.